Welcome to another edition of Hey DT. Hey DT is a series of videos I do where I respond to viewer questions and comments. These viewer questions and comments, they typically come from comments on the videos posted on YouTube and Odyssey. Sometimes these questions and comments come through social media such as Mastodon, Reddit, and sometimes through email. And the very first question is, Hey DT, would you mind explaining how to clear the clipboard on Manjaro? The content still pace even after a reboot. Okay, so we should talk a little bit about how the clipboard on Linux works. There's several different clipboards, but the main one, most people are going to be using Xorg as their display server. And Xorg has a utility called Excel that you could use to clear the clipboard. So what you could do typically just open up a terminal and type the command Excel space dash BC. And that should clear the X11 clipboard. And he mentioned rebooting the computer didn't clear the clipboard's history. Depending on what kind of clipboard you're using, if you're using like a GUI clipboard application, which probably most people on Linux are, most desktop environments have clipboard applets, clipboard managers that ship with them. I know one of the more popular ones out there is a program called Parcelite. I believe it's the default clipboard manager on Linux Mint and probably a lot of other Linux distributions. But all of these GUI clipboard programs, what they do is they save a history so they have a file somewhere on the computer where they save history. So anytime you add something to the clipboard, it saves a backlog. That way you can always search back through the history of your clipboard if you need it. That's one of the really neat features of using those kinds of clipboard managers. Now to clear the history on those applications, typically you can do it within the application. They'll have a way for you just to delete the entire history. Or if you know where that file is located, I believe the Parcelite file, if you happen to be using that program, is in .local slash share slash parcelite slash history is the name of the file. Just get rid of the file. Moving on to the next question, I get asked this all the time since I made a video about this particular application about three years ago. Hey DT, are you still using do as? So do as is an alternative to sudo. So anytime you need elevated privileges on a GNU slash Linux system, typically you have to invoke sudo to give you those privileges. Now the BSD guys have a different program that they use called do as it's do as and sudo they basically do the same thing they give you elevated privileges so that you can do things that your standard home user typically is not allowed to do like install remove software edit important config files things like that now on linux again we typically use sudo and because most of the stuff i do is on linux and a lot of new to linux users watch my content i don't want to confuse them so i typically on my videos i'm always going to use like the standard de facto core utilities and standard command line applications. So I typically don't use do as on video. And that's because again, I don't want to confuse new to Linux users. They're, they're going to be doing these things, imitating some of the commands I do with do as no Linux distribution is going to have do as installed all pretty much your Linux distributions install sudo out of the box. So that would be confusing. That's why on my videos, you always see me use sudo. I have both do as and sudo installed on my systems. But again, because I'm in this unique position of doing these videos, I don't want to confuse people. And that's why I always use sudo on my videos. And the next question is, hey DT, what Arco Linux do you pick when you install Arco Linux? Okay, so you guys know that I run Arco Linux on a lot of my machines. I, I use it on my main workstation here at the office. The machine that I actually produce all of my content on runs Arco Linux. It's been running Arco Linux for like two years now. I, I'm not exactly sure, maybe a little over two years now. This machine has had the same installation of Arco Linux running on it. And then my home computer also has Arco Linux installed on it, but he asked the question, which Arco Linux do you pick when you install Arco Linux? I don't install Arco Linux like on physical equipment that often. Again, I installed Arco Linux on this machine probably two years ago. I installed Arco Linux on my home computer. I don't know when I got that computer, seven, eight months ago. It's not like I'm constantly installing Arco Linux, right? I'm one of these people, typically I install something and if it's working, I'm not in a rush to wipe it out. So I install Arco, I've probably installed Arco Linux hundreds of times in virtual machines to play around with for videos and to test things out with DTOS. But as far as, hey, if I had to reinstall Arco Linux right now, which one would I go grab? It wouldn't matter because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter which version of Arco I install. When I'm done with it, 
putting all my programs and config files and everything on Arco Linux, it's not going to be Arco Linux anymore. It's essentially going to be DT's operating system. I used to make that joke all the time. It didn't matter what operating system I ran as far as a Linux distribution because I have all of my packages and all of my config files on GitLab and I'm going to pull them down and I'm going to wipe out the default configs, whatever distribution shipped with. And it's essentially going to be my operating system. And people kept picking at me. It's like, well, if it's going to be your operating system, why don't you just create your own operating system? And that was kind of the point of the DTOS uh, post-installation script that I finally made, even though I kind of resisted it for a long time. You guys wanted it. But again, for I, I'm a little bit of a unique case because I'm, I've been using Linux for a long time. And if you've been using Linux for a long time, you can probably verify this. If you're one of those people that save all of your config files, your dot files to GitHub, GitLab, it doesn't matter what Linux distribution you install. They're all the same once you put all of your stuff back on that Linux distribution. It really didn't matter what you started with. And then another comment that I've been getting here recently, and it's kind of annoying. That's why I'm going to go ahead and bring it up right now. Hey, DT, pin this comment. Yeah, that's, that's never going to happen. And the next comment comes from Fostodon, which is the Mastodon instance I'm currently on. He says, hey, DT, it seems some of your videos became a class central course. Do you know about this new feature? Smiley face. So we included a link in this message. I clicked on it. Classcentral.com, I think, was the website. Anyway, it's this class course website where you go through these videos. It's like a course kind of website. I don't know if you get a certificate after you watch the videos and you go through the entire course, but there is a class central course that is one of my YouTube playlists, my terminal user interface playlist. I, I don't know how many videos is currently in my TUI playlist. <laughs> it's been adding to it over the years. You know, I've been doing this for nearly five years now. But it's just this one playlist of mine. This playlist is not necessarily geared towards strictly education. There's some educational material to it, but there's also a lot of fun stuff I do with these terminal applications, theming the terminal, random color schemes, things like that. But this guy, I guess he just put this entire YouTube playlist of mine on classcentral.com, and it's a course. So if, I guess if you watch that entire playlist, again, I don't know if you get anything, a, a certificate, a gold star, whatever it is, but uh, all of my videos, are, of course, are licensed under a Creative Commons license. Anybody's free to do anything. And he's actually just linking to the YouTube videos anyway. So no harm, no foul. This guy putting my videos on this site. So I think it's kind of cool that somebody thought this was worth this class central course. Next up, hey DT, I'm studying engineering and I was thinking that I should spend my summer break building software and releasing it under the GPL, but I don't really know how to use it. Like, is it really as simple as attaching a copy of the GPL on my GitHub repo or is there something I'm missing? So yes, it is actually that easy. So anytime you start a project on something like GitHub or GitLab, they already have all of the common free licenses already built in to their website. So if I open a new repository on my GitLab and, you know, it's going to initialize it with a readme and a license and it's going to ask me to choose a license and you really should choose a license. You don't want to leave it not licensed because anything that doesn't include a license technically is proprietary software and nobody is free to do anything with it. So um, a lot of people have this misconception that not adding a license makes it free. No, actually anything that doesn't have a license, we always just assume it's proprietary and that kind of makes sense, right? Because, you, you know, unless the person actually tells me I can do do something with that software right it's technically their software right it's protected so make sure if you actually want to license your stuff under a free license always add that free license to that github or gitlab repo so in this case the gpl will be an option on github and it will just magically create this file this license file on that repo which is a copy of the gpl anybody that forks your repo or clones your repo, they'll get a copy of the GPL license with your source code. And that's really it. There's there's nothing special you need to do. The GPL, you know, anytime you license something under the GPL, there are some things you need to do. The big thing, your source code has to be public. You've already done that. It's on GitHub, right? Your source code's on GitHub and you always have to include a copy of the license with the source code. And again, GitHub or GitLab, they'll take care of that for you when you create that license file. 
The next comment comes from a response from a video I did about how social media is dangerous and how it's kind of destroying our society. This person writes in, Hey DT, as a high school math teacher, I am flabbergasted by how outrageous students sometimes act in my classroom. I've seen students get up and start dancing and twerking for a TikTok video. <laughs> The hateful discussions that they have with each other, it cultivates hate and spite of different groups. Thank you for spreading the word. Well, I appreciate the thank you. And as somebody that has done some teaching uh, in my past life, right, I've been in schools and I've been in some good schools and I've been in some bad schools. And what he's talking about here was students getting up and just start dancing and partying in the middle of a classroom. I've actually seen that. I've actually seen entire schools do this not just a, a couple of kids in a classroom but basically the entire school you know kids just running around hanging off ceilings and walls and nobody can do a dang thing it's one of the reasons why i was really put off shortly after college where i knew i was never going to teach i was never going to teach public school because I'm I'm old school. I know I would choke the life out of one of those kids if they acted that way in my classroom. I know I would do that because these days teachers they're they're so they have their hands tied behind their back. They're not really allowed to discipline students in any way and really these kids these days are out of control and back in the day, you know, the teacher could call home and get a parent on the phone or call the parent at work and let them know, "Hey, you're your child is acting crazy in this classroom. And when that kid get got home, then one of the parents would beat the crap out of that kid and straighten them out. That doesn't happen these days either, because in many cases, we've gotten into this weird situation where these crazy, outrageous kids, immature, you know, they've kind of grown up to be also outrageous, immature adults. And now they're having these crazy kids and you can't call the parents <laughs> to, to d discipline their kids because the parents in many cases are just as crazy and out of control as their kids. And it's one of the sad states, especially with our education system here in the U.S. We spend so much more money on education here in the U.S. than pretty much any country in the world. And we have a terrible education system. It's really sad. Now, getting back to the topic of that video is social media to blame for the way some of these kids are acting. I think social media is a big part of especially the way the parents act and probably some of the kids. I would hope younger kids would not be allowed to be on social media. If these parents were responsible, they wouldn't allow their kids to interact on social media at all. I know I would not. The next question. Hey, DT, I wanted to ask your opinion on OpenSUSE Tumbleweed. I've been using it for a few months now, and I found it to be utterly fantastic. Recently, you made a video asking why KOS wasn't more popular, but in that regard, I think OpenSUSE is the most unfairly underestimated distro. They ought to be as big as Fedora or Ubuntu. Have you tried it recently? Do you have an opinion? Thanks for the videos. And that's interesting because you don't see that many people using OpenSUSE these days. You don't hear anybody talking about it. You know, until you brought up OpenSUSE to me in this question, I had almost forgot OpenSUSE existed. And, you know, there's a lot of once very popular Linux distributions that now are not that popular and vice versa. Distributions that have been around forever, nobody really ever took seriously. And now they're starting to gain some traction. That's just the way this thing works. And the problem with OpenSUSE, and there's another RPM distro I want to bring up, PC Linux OS. Those two distributions, OpenSUSE and PC Linux OS, were very popular Linux desktop distributions at one time before Ubuntu kind of came on the scene. Before Ubuntu came on the scene, a lot of the RPM distributions were kind of the main desktop distributions everybody ran, such as OpenSUSE. Uh, uh, Mandriva was really big back then. And then kind of Ubuntu exploded on the scene. And then kind of the Debian distributions were where everybody was going to on the desktop. Now, does that mean OpenSUSE and PC Linux OS and some of these other distributions that have lost some popularity in recent years? Does that mean they're no longer good distributions? No, just means not as many people are using them. Does popularity really mean anything? No, right? If you like the distribution you're running, keep running it. I, I tell you guys this all the time. It really doesn't matter. You know, I, 
It's great that Ubuntu has so many users. I don't use Ubuntu, you know, not not on any of my desktop machines right now. Does that mean that the Linux distribution I'm using is somehow inferior? Well, I'm using Arco Linux. How many users do you think Arco Linux has in comparison to Ubuntu? Probably less than one tenth of a percent, right? I'm just putting it out there, right? Ubuntu has many, 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 many more times users than Arco Linux. I don't care. I like Arco Linux and it works for me. What does it matter? Now, one interesting thing about your question, you mentioned OpenSUSE tumbleweed not being as popular. I actually disagree with that a little bit. I actually see OpenSUSE tumbleweed actually come up a lot more in discussions these days. I think the thing with OpenSUSE is OpenSUSE Leap, which is the stable branch of OpenSUSE. I think that is really waned in popularity because I think a lot more people are catching on with the fact that rolling releases are kind of where it's at and that rolling releases aren't as unstable as some people make them out. So in a lot of ways, I think OpenSUSE transitioning more focusing on tumbleweed has kind of been a good thing for them and i i wouldn't be surprised if OpenSUSE tumbleweed doesn't start seeing a lot more users in the near future and the final question hey dt i know as an arch user that you probably don't need these but i'm wondering what software do you have installed as a flat pack snap or app image so i'm not exactly sure what all i have installed as a flat pack snap and app image i just pulled up a terminal i ran flat pack list and it looks like right now i have obs studio installed as a flat pack i have bottles installed as a flat pack bottles as a front end to wine it's a way to get some of your windows applications hopefully to run in Linux. And I also have Caden Live installed as a flat pack. And now I just ran the snap list command to see all the snaps I have installed on the system. I really don't have that many snaps installed. Really, if you don't count some of the base snap stuff like the core package and some theming stuff, I have the snap store installed, which is the GNOME Software Center itself. It's really a front end to Snapcraft. So it's just a, a store filled with all the snap packages from Snapcraft. And then I also have 0AD installed as a snap. 0AD, you guys know, is my, like my favorite game, real-time strategy game. I've done a many videos of me playing 0AD on camera. And installing it as a snap is actually pretty quick and easy because the snap servers are pretty fast and the 0AD download is pretty big and it typically, typically installs faster using snap than it does using something like apt or pacman I found. And as far as gameplay with 0AD, whether you install it through a native package manager or snap, doesn't matter. It's the same speed. I, I don't see any difference. Now I just ran a ls in my applications directory. Applications is typically the folder where all of your app images go. And I, you guys know I'm a fan of app images. As far as snaps, flat packs, app images, I typically default to app images most of the time. But I don't mind installing snaps and flat packs, especially if a piece of software they default to one of those. You know, like if the maintainer of the of a particular project says, hey, go grab the flat pack, I'll go grab the flat pack. Or if they say, go grab the snap, I'll take their recommendation, I'll go grab the snap. But if they offer multiple package formats and app images, one of them, I typically will go get the app image. Right now, my app images, I have Belina Etcher, I have the Brave Web Browser as an app image, I have Discord, I have Edex UI, which is a fancy terminal, I have the Flameshot app image, I have Jitsi as an app image, and Jitsi app images actually the version of Jitsi I use for every monthly chat with patrons that I do. I have two different Caden Live app images. I have a LibreWolf app image. I have Movie Monad, which is a movie player written in Haskell. I have that as an app image. I have Stacer as an app image. Stacer is a system cleaner. I have VLC as an app image. And I also have Conch, the Conch shell, X-O-N-S-H, because app image, you can actually app image shells. <laughs> you can app image bash or fish, or in this case, Conch, which is kind of neat. One of the really cool things with app images. So there's a little bit of what I have installed on my system as far as these universal package formats. Again, I'm not a, a package format snob. If I need a program, I really don't care what package format it's packaged at if you need it you need it so these people that for whatever reason refuse to install snaps or refuse to install flat bags or whatever it happens to be uh, if you really need a piece of software then refusing to install it with one of these formats if that's the only way to get it that's kind of crazy i don't understand those kinds of people 
Now, before I go, I need to thank a few special people. I need to thank the producers of this episode. Dustin Gabe, James Matt, Maxim, Michael Mitchell, Paul, Wes, Wanya Ball, Nomi, Alan, Armor Dragon, Chuck, Commander Angry, Dai Yokai, Dylan Gregg, Mars Drummer, Jan, Alexander, Peace Arch, Vitor, Polytech, Realities for Less, Red Prophet, Steven, Tools, Devler, and Willie. These guys, they're my highest tiered patrons over on Patreon. They are the producers of this episode of Hey DT. The show is also brought to you by each and every one of these fine ladies and gentlemen. All these names you're seeing on the screen right now. These are all my supporters over on Patreon because I don't have any corporate sponsors. I'm sponsored by you guys, the community. If you like my work and want to see more videos of Linux, free and open source software, subscribe to DistroTube over on Patreon. All right, guys. Peace.